The following program is brought to you by the University of Alabama. Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is author Peter Golden, longtime journalist, biographer, historian, and recently the author of two novels, Come Back Love and Wherever There Is Light. This is an epic story of Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany, the African-American colleges that rescued them, and a long, intense interracial love affair between a Jewish-American gangster and a talented, beautiful black photographer. Please join me at the Alabama Booksmith as I talk with novelist Peter Golden. Mr. Golden, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. We're here really to talk about your two new novels. They're, they're really, they both qualify as new, but you qualify as new also. On this show, you've not been on this show before. Our viewers would be interested in who is this fella. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. You were born where, raised where, was, educated where? I was where? born in Newark, New Jersey. I grew up in a suburb of Newark, uh, South Orange and Maplewood, New Jersey, about 12 miles from New York City. I went to school at Ohio University for two years and graduated from the State University of New York at Albany. There is no higher recommendation. Yes, I know, because you're, <laughs> you're also a graduate. Your, your, all of your biographical material, I mean, of course it emphasizes the titles of your books, as it, as it should. But it says, uh, mixed in with, with uh, the individual titles, is a, this career in writing, this career in journalism. Um, I was curious. Did you did you work for a major paper? Did you did you work for AP? No, what, what I, I, is that? I worked for myself. I, I wanted to be a writer, and in order to support yourself as a writer, you write what people will pay you for. Uh -huh. And at various parts of my life, I was paid for different things. So, magazine. I wrote a lot for magazines. I wrote and I wrote books. I wrote books, uh, memoirs for people. I wrote biography. I wrote history, and now I'm writing novels. You have. A biography called Quiet Diplomat. <laughs> Quiet Diplomat was a reference to Max Fisher. Max Fisher was a an active Republican who did a lot of private diplomacy between the Middle East and Israel. So what that book became was sort of um, a, a, a history of the diplomatic relationship between the United States and Israel between the 1940s and the 1980s. And I that was the reason I wound up interviewing so many presidents and Nixon and Reagan and Ford and, and then, of course, Secretaries of State Kissinger and Schultz and others and then uh, Israeli Prime Ministers, Rabin and other ones. Yeah. So that was my entree into that world. And once I did that, that sort of led me to this Cold War history, the, the relationship between the Soviet Jewry movement and the Cold War. And so that, of course, led to interviewing Gorbachev and how that whole thing ended. But in the process of that, I wrote a history of how Jews became part of the United States, particularly the baby boom generation, what happened to them. And this is what's led actually to my novels. It was writing um, that history, it was right after my interview with Gorbachev, when I asked myself, well, what really was the greatest change in America after the Cold War? I mean, after the Second World War. And I think it was the role, the changing role of women. And I sat down and I wrote that novel, Come Back Love, after that. In several of your books, it's the Jews in America seem to be at the center of diplomacy, international uh, international intrigue. Well, I think I think to some degree, in the case of the Cold War, you needed, and this of course ties to the civil rights movement. One of the power that the civil rights movement had in the in the 60s, particularly, was they had the power to embarrass the president because here the president was trying to convince the whole world to do it our way because we believed in freedom. And the Soviet Union was so oppressive. So we're trying to convince everybody of that and they have all these African Americans saying, excuse me, we can't vote. So what are, you, what are you doing? So Kennedy tries to talk Dr. King out of the March on Washington. And, but the power of the March on Washington for political leaders was that it was an embarrassment. And, and it, uh, as, as was Little Rock. I mean, Eisenhower went on television during the Little Rock and said that anyone preventing these children from going to school was un-American and giving aid and comfort to our enemies, namely the Soviet Union. 
by the time you get to the Soviet Union not allowing the Jews out, mm -hmm. they were saying, well, no, don't do it their, their way. Do it our way. We're so much, we're so much more uh, freer. And they also, anti-Semitism was against the law in the Soviet Union. So by highlighting this injustice but not letting people leave, we use that as a wedge, and it made it much more understandable than talking about throw weights and, and all the kinds of things that people got into when you talk about missile uh, diplomacy. We didn't, people don't understand missile diplomacy. They understand we won't let these people leave. We put these people in prison. That they got. So Schultz and Reagan, to their credit, used that as a wedge against the Soviet Union. That's, that's why that's sort of at the center. Israel was at the center, because as it still is, because it was our one real reliable ally in the Middle East, and as you can see now, what's going on. So we sort of need them. That was that issue. Yeah, the Jewish, it's not a, a peculiar that your protagonist, that your interests would be in Jewish American history, or that your protagonists would be Jewish American men, mostly. Right. I heard recently, all this study on, of, of all the new developments in brain science, one of the new developments in brain science is apparently that the first person that you really fall in love with is imprinted on you forever, which is what makes high school and college reunions so dangerous. You have actually a novel, Come Back Love, in which a couple meet, are together, part, and the title does suggest mm -hmm. the ending. I, mean, right. I don't think this is a murder, a murder mystery. Right. Uh, one of the things that struck me about that book and, and the new one is love is hard. You make love hard. Well, I think, <laughs> I think it is. I think <laughs> Americans tend to be a little bit messianic. So every movement in America, we think everything's going to be solved. And so you have this women's movement that starts in the, I mean, you could go back all the way in history, but let's start with the one in the late 60s. And people thought this would solve all these problems. And in the end, of course, it just makes life, anything that makes life more complicated, it makes life more problematic. And I think women particularly got caught in this bind of sandwich between work and love and family and parents and all kinds of things. And of course, men just sort of going along with this whole thing, they're caught in the middle because their worlds really revolve around women anyway. And so what happened to women and how that impacted men, and that's what I chose to write about. But you can't really understand it, it seems to me, unless you look at the 1960s and then look at now. And so that's why the book goes back and forth between the past and the present. She is a medical student. She's actually, she's an MD when the- Ultimately, when the, yes, at the end of the, in the right. present, she's a, she's a doctor. In the past, she's a medical student. Right, right. And she's obviously interested in a career. But one of the things that crops up in her life, in your depiction of her life, and in other lives in your fiction, is bad parenting. A lot of these characters of yours have been slightly damaged by their mothers and fathers. Well. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's a fair I think that's a very, I think that's a, a very accurate reading. And I could, I could say to you that novels live in the world of conflict, and so you don't want to give someone really loving, perfect parents. Uh -huh. um, but I think that, that for these characters, this is true. I, I think that often parents have a difficult time raising children. I think they often make mistakes with the best of intentions. And I think parents have their own troubles. And so children sometimes get caught up in those troubles. <laughs> and so my characters tend to cope with problems with parents. They are. If they were all perfectly healthy, then their love relationships would be perfectly healthy. And but who not. would want to read a novel about them? <laughs> not likely. In Comeback Love, uh, your protagonist goes off to Woodstock. And I was just poking around in your bibliography. You've written about Woodstock more than once. You have a nice magazine article about Woodstock, right. up, up, published it in Albany Magazine. Yep. And you have a nice scene, uh, sort of at the fringes of Woodstock in Comeback Love. You tend to have uh, scenes that, that match up with chronologic, what you think to be, uh, rightly, I right. think, chronologically important cultural events, or culturally important events. Woodstock's one of them. What does Woodstock mean? It's the what? end of the 1960s. It is the end. It's the end of the 1960s. It's the last great celebration of the 1960s, because shortly after Woodstock, we have the Manson killings, and that's the end of the 1960s. In other words, the, what people think of as the 1960s, a very, very brief mm 
brief time. Mm -hmm. You see it, first time it comes to national attention is the Summer of Love, and that's in 67, and you see all these people dancing around, and Scott McKenzie wrote a song, if you're going to San Francisco, wear flowers in your hair, and all of this jazz. By 68, Haight-Ashbury was a mess. By 69, it was full of heroin addicts and, and child prostitutes, and it was horrible. Um, and underneath the 1960s was this other culture that you saw with the Manson gang. And it wasn't just the Mansons, there were, there were other things. I mean, Richard Speck happens during the 1960s. He's the fellow who murdered eight, eight or nine nurses in right. Chicago. Right. So I, there was a lot of, underneath this sort of um, bucolic view of, this, uh, of the 1960s, this view sort of written by Rousseau about how wonderful we all are, you had this horror. And every night you watched Vietnam on TV. So I always found it, even as a kid, to be a bit ridiculous. But Woodstock, to me, signaled the end of all that because after that you had shortly after within a year you have the bombing the people become aware of the bombing of cambodia you have kids killed on college campuses all over america um and it, it really starts to go and then you move into the sort of almost a nihilistic uh, 1970s and then you come out on the other end with yuppies i think i have some idea about this but what's it like to interview really, really, really important and powerful people. Well, it can be very moving. I'll tell you a story about <laughs> my next interview. Um, at the time, they weren't sure whether he would allow me to tape the interview. For oh. obvious reasons, he had mixed feelings about tapes. And um, so I had my little tape recorder with me, and I brought it in, and he, he comes out of his office, he extends his hand, shakes my hand, and I dropped the tape recorder on his foot. And it was one of those <laughs> big cassette recorders. But he was very, he was very nice about it. Um, and it was a wonderful interview, but I'll tell you the most, to me, the most moving part of the interview. First of all, he began to write me letters after the interview, which was very interesting. But during the interview, he had a tendency to speak in paragraphs, in part because some of these questions I'm sure he'd either thought about for a long time sure. or had been asked before. But what I asked him was, why didn't you come out of Vietnam? You knew that you were going to do China. You knew that. No one else knew what you were going to do. Um, you knew there was no way you were going to win that war in any sort of meaningful way. And this, you might have controlled the battlefield, but they weren't going to give up. They weren't going to say, okay, we'll all become one Vietnam. Why didn't you just pull the troops out? Now, he spoke in paragraphs. Mm -hmm. This yes. is the shortest answer he ever gave me. And, and I'll never forget as long as I look at his face. was He looked um, not the least bit surprised by the question, but somewhat upset by the question, if, I, if that makes sense, um, or perplexed by the answer. And this was his answer, because I thought something worse would happen. And that was it. He didn't say. Well, what it. well it was pretty, given what we were talking about, uh -huh. I, what he meant was he thought that they would pressure, they would pressure uh, the, their Arab allies. And that the, what he was really afraid of was that the Israelis and the Arabs would get to a point where somebody would set off the Israelis had, wow. had nukes. So I think that's what he was worried about, but he felt that as horrible as Vietnam was, he had some control of how that outcome. But if something started somewhere else, he'd have absolutely no control over that. And, and it was a really interesting answer. I wish he had spoken more about it while he was alive because it's really something people needed to hear. Um, he never, I don't recall him writing that kind of thing in his books. And I just, it was just a pragmatic decision. And it was, that was, interviewing Rabin, I interviewed Yitzhak Rabin, and that was fascinating. That was sort of like interviewing George Washington, if he would talk. I mean, you don't know if you could get Washington, would he talk? But Rabin, Rabin had, like Washington, was involved in every aspect of the creation of that country. Yeah. And so he had a foot soldier's view all the way to prime minister's view. And that was fascinating. And he gave me a, he gave me a lot of time. So that was great. We had a couple Good. hours. Well, these people were retired when you... No, he was working. He well, was he the was defense minister and was uh, during the Intifada. But right. he, he, he had a lot to say. Yeah, <laughs> Nixon was, must have been done. No, Nixon, was, Nixon was done, right. right. Nixon. Well, your new novel. Your, this, this is the novel that uh, is going to be, uh, I think, for, for fiction, for you, the breakthrough, the breakthrough novel. Thank you. You have a Jewish protagonist. Not just... He's not just Jewish. He's not Philip Roth Jewish. No. He is, he's, he's, there's, a, there's a Jersey boy here. Right. But your protagonist is a... Gangster. He comes to America in 28. Yeah. He's a bootlegger 
<clears throat> until I guess prohibition <laughs> ends. Right. And then he's a gangster, Jewish gangster, all through the 30s. Right. <clears throat> um, a lot of people. I mean, I there's there's uh, Meyer Lansky and a few famous ones, but most people don't think of this. They don't. This is right. not. This is not the popular image that they're yeah. Jewish gangsters. And he's a tough guy. Yeah, Longy's woman, uh, who he sort of modeled on, and is also in the book, uh -huh. was probably the most astute of all the Jewish gangsters. Um, but the reason people don't know about him is he was smart. He didn't want people to know about him, although he was called before the Rackets Committee. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, it's great you brought up Roth, so I have a sort of a policy statement about that, because Roth was born, Roth grew up in Newark, sure. he was just born there. I don't know, I mean, Roth's Newark is so far from the Newark that I knew, because I knew the Newark, the Newark of my uh, grandfather, mm. who was an immigrant. I knew the, the Newark of my father and my uncle, both of whom were in the Second World War. I mean, the Jews that I knew in Newark were not the Jew, were not they were Alexander, not, they were not Alexander Portnoy. No, <laughs> no, they were not. And no. um, they were, in their own way, very tough guys. And it was kind of hard to imagine that Roth writes about how they're scared of these, the non-Jewish kids that play for their football team. I mean, these guys were in the war. I mean, people are trying to kill him. So, I mean, that, I mean, I appreciate what the Roth is writing, but Roth is a, a very big difference. Roth, I think, is born in 33. The people that, that I knew, my father's generation, yeah. they're born in the, in the early 20s. That 10 years made a huge difference. Just like people born in 1954 and 1964 experienced a much different world. But it was true yes. then. So the Newark I'm interested in was a Newark that was touched by prohibition and then the Second World War, and the Holocaust, because there were a lot of Jews in Newark. And so those were the, the great events of the lives of these people. Yeah, the one thing I, I, I would underline it, I, th I think you're really on to it, is I, I think in the 20th century, it, I was born in 41, other people born in 51, 61, it's a world of difference. Right. Every, every 10 years, right. your childhood experiences are going to be, are, you're going to come out of a different Petri dish completely. You're going to be shaped Absolutely. differently. Absolutely. Your, your um, <clears throat> protagonist has come to America. His father, back in... Berlin. B Berlin, right. yeah. Usually they're in Austria, usually they're in Vienna, but, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but in this case, Berlin. He's reluctant to come. And this is when you do something interesting in this novel, that is the connection between the, you know, the uh, black colleges in America and these intellectual immigrants. Einstein went to Princeton, but your protagonist's father goes to a little place in Florida. Well, Einstein, the, the Hitler fires all the professors in 35. And the German professor class as a class was probably the most esteemed in the world. They weren't all Einstein, though. And there was Einstein and there was Freud, who was, they begged him to go anywhere. They were begging him all over the world to come. Sure. He finally went to London. Um, but there was a whole other class. These guys were, they just weren't as famous as these other guys. Of course not. So the African-American colleges hired them. And that's how they got into this country. Otherwise, they would, have, they would have stayed. There was no way to get into this country without someone to take care of you right. or without a job. And who's given out jobs in the Depression? Well, so, those colleges got some first-rate minds. Right. And the, the professors they hired got out of and Germany their families, and Austria. And their and families. And their families. Right. Your Julian, your Julian Rose, right. your protagonist, falls in love with a black girl down at this college. I mean, she's the, she's the uh, daughter of the president. president. Right. And she's a charming. Kendall. Kendall, and she's, a, she's smart, and she's talented, and they fall in love. But as usual, things will not go well. But the, 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 this, the, take this question as you like. They have a relationship in Florida. They have it in Greenwich Village. They have it in Paris, and that mixed race uh, love affair fares differently wherever wherever they are, and so you have a kind of a you have a kind of a study in in a tiny way, it's, you know, one book, a kind of a study of of um, the difficulties, the good the good place <laughs> better and not so good places to be. I mean, this is in your mind. It's clear in the book. This is what you have in mind. Right. Things work better here than there, and not so well there. The the ultimate question I was trying to decide is that in the late 1950s, James Baldwin wrote an essay in which he said the following: that the these his quotes quote unquote the Negro question is such a persistent problem in American life 
because it has become something where people hide all sorts of questions about themselves mm -hmm. inside of it. In other words, it was a symbolic hatred in many ways that helped people deal with their own issues, their own problems. And I wanted to test that. And the way I tested it was by following, as you, as you noticed. In the South, in Florida, there was, it was profoundly segregated. So there's some funny scenes there about that. I was also interested in how Julian did not quite appreciate Kendall's nervousness about the South. Um, Greenwich Village, which was supposed to be so liberated, ah, yes, uh, turns out to be in many ways as segregated as the South. Paris, where they didn't care about such issues, not that they were liberated from these kinds of things, since they were certainly very aggressive toward the Algerians, um, they have other problems. So I was curious, is this an issue, uh, an issue of race? Or is this an issue that men and women struggle with regardless of race? And you can't answer that question unless you put them in Paris, which is why Paris becomes so important to the book. Mm -hmm. So I'll, let, I'll leave it to the reader to discover what they think. Um, but that was the reason I put them there. You have her, she's smart, and she's really good looking, very sexy heroine you have there. But she's also talented. She is, she is a photographer, and she gets her start up in Harlem. And right. then, then she, she moves to, to Paris, and she, she uh, is a photographer in Paris. I was reminded of, of the Lee Miller, and that most people don't know much about Lee Miller. And Lee Miller was not black. She was a Vogue model cover girl. Right. But uh, I, I, I can see the similarities. You had this in mind, some. I, some, I did. I, yeah. First of all, she's very beautiful like Lee Miller was. Um, secondly, Lee Miller struggled terribly after the war, yeah. which Kendall struggles terribly. And I, I think that's sort of an under underexplored area, the, um, the traumatic stress that these journalists suffer coming home. Um, and she certainly, and Lee Miller was certainly uh, struggled with those things. Well, they took the first photographs at the liberated death camps. Right. And it changed them forever. Right. And I, I, so I think that was one part. Um, the part I was particularly interested in is that photography was one of the first careers that women could pick up. And it's very funny, um, their technical training they, they got their technical training because men who owned studios, where they took mostly pictures of families, how they earned their living, figured that women would be better at keeping the kids seated and quiet while they took the pictures. Is <laughs> that right? Yeah. I did not, never, yeah. I've never known that. So yeah. in the 30s, this, in the 20s, in the 30s, this, oh, women started to get this technical training in this equipment. And so this started to open up for women. And there's a moment where she's talking about, Kendall is talking to Julian about, this being an, ad, an advantage, and it seems that the art world is kind of locked up by men for the most part. She wants a Leica, and Julian, of course, buys her her first Leica camera because she wants to be what the French call a flaneur, which is a wanderer, uh, where you sort of take street photography, Bresson being the, one of the most famous. And that's how she gets her start in Harlem. She becomes a flaneur in Harlem. And, um, be, but she gives up art. She wants to be a painter, which was very, which is interesting, you know, Man Ray, started as a painter, the, the lover of uh, Lee Miller. And then, you know, he took pictures as well. And now it turns out Picasso took lots of pictures. So it's an, it was an interesting combination. It was not unusual. Bresson started as a painter as well. It was good, it was the right moment, both in Harlem and in, and, and in, in, in Europe, Paris. Yeah. It, was, it was the right moment. The, there is a, a certain PTSD was probably suffered by Roman legionnaires. They, we just didn't have, didn't have the labels. But both, both uh, Kendall and Julian, uh, Julian has a war. He's involved with the OSS. You have, you have a certain number of celebrities in your novels. You have right. Wild Bill Donovan. In. Wild Bill Donovan <laughs> plays a, somewhat a major minor role in my, yeah. my novel. He was quite a character, actually. But that, uh, you know, this reminded me, uh, oddly, I recently read a new biography of J.D. Salinger who had been a Jewish American intelligence, he was a sergeant, right. but he interviewed uh, German prisoners of war and was, and moved across uh, Northern France and Belgium at the, in, in 44, 45, and was traumatized by the experience. It's always to me been the great secret of a catcher in the rye, is that Holden Caulfield is Jewish. Holden Caulfield knows more than most about anti-Semitism and Holden Caulfield feels uh, uncomfortable with it wherever he goes. And I can't help but think that those feelings were intensified for Salinger during the war 
when he came back and he wrote that, remembering his prep school days, that he layered that on top of his prep school. It's the, it's, to me, it make the, that book makes a lot more sense if you know that he, if you know he's Jewish. Julian's anyway. a tough guy, yes. but, but there, are, there, there are no <clears throat> brains that are tough enough to stand some of the imagery and some of the experiences that came with Dachau, the Buchenwald, the well, he also winds up becoming, a, I think it was probably not the, in some ways it was a good job for him, but in some ways it was short-sighted. He becomes an interrogator at, um, at the Nuremberg trials. Right. And at one point they have to send him home because he beats up a German, German general so badly who tells him it wasn't really his fault. And so they send, they send him back to the States because they don't, can't have him turning this guy into a vegetable. Well, so, I, I can't, it would be wrong to give away the ending of your love story, but anyone who read the first book has a clue. So there we are. Right. We're at the present. What, what, when we sit down and talk again in a, a year or two, what will the new book be? What are you working on? I'm doing a book about the, the um, connection between the Holocaust and the Cold War and what went on in Germany and the United States as they tried to work out the reality of what had happened in Germany, which took a long time. Um, some would say they're still working. It, it went into the 80s, I think, until... Fiction or nonfiction? Uh, no, uh, novel. A novel. Yes. Excellent. Well, when you finish, I'll read it, and we'll talk again. Well, thank you very much for having me, Don. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. <laughs>